Welcome to Face to Face with me, Lauren Booth. I am joined today by the Labour Party's longest serving Member of Parliament, who, when he left the House of Parliament in 2001 to retire, said he was devoting more time to politics. He has served as the Secretary of State for Trade, Industry and Energy, and today he is the President of the Stop the War Coalition. I'm talking about Tony Benn. Tony Benn, welcome to Face to Face. Let's talk a little bit about Stop the War Coalition, which has become a force on the outside of British politics. It's been a bane in the side of this government now for eight years. Who is Stop the War and what is your agenda? Well, it began, uh, there'd always been, when the earlier conflicts, there'd always been campaigns to stop the war. But the Stop the War Coalition really began after 9-11, when it was obvious that uh, the American government intended to invade Iraq. And that was what uh, provided the occasion for the Stop the War Coalition to come into being, brings together a campaign for nuclear disarmament, and people from different political parties, I mean, the leading conservatives and liberals and others are active in it. <coughs> and what it does is to organize meetings and it is a campaign organisation to shift public opinion on the subject of that war, and now the Afghan war, of course. And it has been very successful in the sense that the opinion polls suggest uh, the majority of people in this country are not in favour of the war that we had with, Af with uh, Iraq or with Afghanistan. So in a democracy, the right to campaign for a different policy is an integral part of what you can do, and that's what we're doing. It's interesting that you say that the Stop the War's agenda is to change public opinion, because when you were an MP, you said, I will not be ruled by Mr Hansard and uh, um, uh, Mr Gallup, that these polls shouldn't matter to politics. And in fact, unfortunately, a million people on the streets <coughs> didn't stop the invasion of Iraq. No, but to get a change of policy does take a lot of time. How long did it take for women to get the vote? I mean, women had always demanded the vote, and to begin with, it was ignored. And then uh, after that, uh, the women who wanted the vote were seen as dangerous. Some of them were imprisoned. Then there was a pause. And then at the end, you couldn't find anyone at the top who didn't claim to have been in favour of it in the first place. That is how progress is made from the bottom to the top. Let's talk a bit about um, the previous Prime Minister, Tony Blair's role in the invasion of Iraq. There have been several inquiries into the way that Britain was taken to war. Do you see a time when Tony Blair, as no longer under the protection of a political role, will be taken to court? for uh, international war crimes, for example? Well, I think war crimes were committed, there's, there's no doubt about it in my mind, during the Iraq war. But I have, with the passage of time, been converted uh, to the Desmond Tutu view of truth and reconciliation. I think taking one man and putting the whole responsibility upon his shoulders and hanging him is not the right answer. I mean, we saw that with the hanging of Saddam Hussein. I give an example, supposing at the end of apartheid, Mandela had insisted that the white leaders, de Klerk and Vorster, had been hanged. Uh, there would have been bloodshed from that moment to this, but uh, he didn't. He said, talk, discuss, bring out what happened. And so uh, I, I, I think uh, the inquiry, an inquiry one day will say war crimes were committed, and Mr Blair and others who were responsible will have to live with that until the day they die. But I'm not in favour of hanging individuals and assuming that solves the problem. I don't think it does. There's now uh, Barack Obama's talking about a surge of military yes. personnel, 30,000 more troops into Afghanistan. And this uh, Gordon Brown as Prime Minister is really struggling to find a foothold with the troops. 
Why are we in Afghanistan, in your opinion? What is the, what are British troops' agenda there? Well, our role in Afghanistan is a very interesting one because it's not the first time we've been there. In 1839, over a hundred years ago, uh, the Viceroy of India reported to the government in London that the Shah of Persia was interfering in the Indian Empire. So Britain sent troops into Afghanistan in 1839, captured Kabul, and a year later withdrew. And uh, when we left, 15,000 British troops were killed. We went again in 1879. We were there again in 1919. The Russians have been there. Afghanistan, because of its critical geographical position, has been a victim of, of invasion from so many different sources. And I think that uh, the war in, in Afghanistan is bound to end in tragedy for those who thought it up in the first place. There's a lot of confusion about the British public's response to this, isn't there? Because the, uh, on the one hand, we've got the sad repatriation of uh, military personnel from Afghanistan, an increasing number over the past number of months. People cheering um, the forces as they return from Afghanistan from tours of duty, and yet you would say a growing number of people who don't want our troops there. So how do the two things work? Well, I think that's what often happens, you see. <coughs> if you take so many cases of British imperial history, uh, we occupied India and Pakistan and Burma and so on, and. That was the empire, and there were the flag-waving newspapers that favoured it. And then there were people who said, we shouldn't be there, why are we there? And gradually, opinion shifted. So I think you have to see this as a change of opinion. And I wouldn't say more than that the Stop the War Coalition is playing one part in this, but of course it's the events that are changing it. But it is the fact the Stop the War Coalition is active in promoting the facts that is, uh, makes it interesting. Talking of facts, the, the, the British media seems intent on calling um, people in Iraq and Afghanistan who oppose the military invasion insurgents, enemy combatants. Is that how you see the, the violence on the ground that the British troops are, are, are facing? Are Afghanistanis enemy combatants of the British military? Well, language is very important, and the press has ever got a very important role. That's why, you know, this broadcast is important, because you're putting or allowing me to put a different point of view. <coughs> but if you describe everyone who defends their own country as a militant, uh, then you are really distorting language. I mean, I'll give you an example. In 1940, uh, we thought the Germans might invade Britain. And uh, they set up a thing called Dad's Army, which was old men and some young children put them together in a defence force. And in 1941, when I was 16, I joined Dad's Army and I learned to fire a machine gun and use a bayonet and a rifle and a revolver. And if the Nazis had arrived uh, and I'd had a, a machine gun, I'd have shot them or thrown a grenade into a cafe where they were having a meal would I have been a terrorist or a freedom fighter? So language is very important, and the way we've conducted the argument is to draw attention to the fact that we have found a word which allows us not to talk to those we're fighting.